Hello, my name's Lizzie Karen, and welcome to the channel I've created on my dreams of Atlantis. This is part three of a series of episodes on uh, the stonework of the ancients. And in this particular episode, we're going to talk about the big megalithic blocks. One of the interesting things about uh, megalithic sized blocks is that you can travel all around the world and find similar examples of massive stone blocks. In the last episode, we talked about the massive polygonal blocks, but this time we're going to talk about the uh, more standardized blocks, blocks that look like they've been cut or in fact have been cut. So very large blocks and usually cube or, or rectangular sized. These are the ones that we're going to look at. You may ask, why do I bother to differentiate since they're all basically giant megalithic blocks? But there was a different mindset between the polygonal uh, construction techniques and the straight block construction techniques. And that's really what I'm getting at. So I think it'll all become clearer very soon once I start explaining. I'm sure you'd all like to get to the point where I tell you about the, the various machines used. But that's probably going to be in another episode because, first of all, we, we have to start where you, you start, which is the planning phase. So block sizes were planned out in detail so that the exact block might be cut. I'll come back to the planning phase a bit later. and I'll just step into the quarry right now. With two techniques for quarrying the rock that would be, it was being cut to, to size. So large chunks were removed from a quarry by drilling strategic holes, filling the holes with an expanding substance, and when done correctly, a large piece could be removed. Then this could be cut to size. Alternatively, a machine was used to scoop out the rock around up the part of the, um, the ground that was required to be taken out, and this was commonly used for when an obelisk or um, a statue was required so that the exact dimensions could be just removed from the bedrock. And this technique is a bit more wasteful, but it is necessary when it came to doing the obelisks and the statues, but not so much necessary when it came to just getting blocks for building purposes. Once quarried, the natural stone blocks were cut to size using the machines and yes, these are the machines that are going to come soon. I'm going to explain them to you, I do promise. But right now, we've got to come back to the planning stage. I just touched on it earlier, but now I've got to get down to the nitty gritty because this is really the important bit. So planning is the key. So at first, the, a three-dimensional plan was drawn up so that non-conventional shapes within the structure could be catered for. So weight distribution and stress being an important part of the consideration when putting together this plan. Hence, there are non-conforming sizes of blocks. So let's pretend we are planning a pyramid structure. We establish what we want it for and therefore what components, rooms, shafts, access ways, etc. would be required. Next, we plan these components as if they are standalone. So we plan them as if they're able to cope all on their own with weight distribution of the roof and any specific changes in building materials and relative strength are included in the plan. Then we add into the plan any security aspects like sealing off a particular area or waterproofing another area or making part of it airtight. These are all possible aspects required of parts of the building. Then the resonance factors would be taken into account if resonance or vibration figures into the operation of the building, which it often did. Again, looking at modeling the design in terms of stress and testing with these standalone models. Uh, for example, what would happen in an earthquake? The next part of the plan involves putting the standalone component parts together in the plan and seeing if they affect each other or if they 
can be compatible in a way that it doesn't prevent any of the components from doing what it's supposed to do. So once that, um, basically a juggling act, um, is done, and once again, uh, go through the modeling of the stress testing, etc., then we can look at how we put together the structure around it. Now, the structure around it, um, it's for protection and it's for weight distribution um, so that it basically protects the component parts within the building. It um, provides um, an ability to ensure that there's no additional stress on those components and it also provides a buffeting area so for example for the resonance or if there was uh, electricity distribution and those sorts of things or, or any kind of pressure so it it basically is designed around those factors I'm probably pointing out the obvious, but everything that I've said so far is a massive oversimplification of the whole thing. It's a bit like, how do you explain the color blue to someone who's never seen the sky? So we've covered the functional aspects of the building, and now we're moving on to the protective parts of the building. So they are planned in a completely different way. The protective parts, obviously, are planned around the functional aspects. And one has to calculate the size of the outer structure that's required to sufficiently protect the planned components. And then looking at any aspects of the functional part that will go through the protective part. Let's say it's things like shafts or access ways, that sort of thing. So still on the subject of the protective aspects of the building. So that's the buffering area, the, the shell, um, and basically the structure that gives strength to the component parts within. At this point, we will have a plan that shows the exact dimensions of every block that makes up the structure, including the type of stone it needs to be. So looking at this plan that we've just created, on a level by level basis, you would see that some of the blocks required need absolute precision and other blocks can be cut rough and yet other areas of the plan may only require fill and then of course you've got to decide whether or not they're all going to be cut blocks or if some of those blocks are going to be manufactured either way the plan will specify that and more importantly it will specify the order in which the blocks are laid I have many um, dream regressions of my time at the Building and Mining Institute and most of them are a lot more exciting than what I've just described. But in any situation where you want to do something properly, you've actually got to go through some of the boring bits before you get to the interesting bits. So um, I'm sorry to have put you all through all that planning, but it was necessary. And when I come to telling you some of the actual dream regressions that I've had during my time at the um, Building and Mining Institute, it's so much fun. I think I had a lot of dreams about that because it was so enjoyable to me. Okay, so let's get back to those pyramids. So we're now at the point on our imaginary pyramid building project that we have a detailed plan and a stack of raw materials. So what's the next step? Well, that's to make sure that we have a good foundation. I did actually cover this in the previous episode and the same approach applies whether you're building with cut blocks or manufactured blocks. 
For the purpose of our imaginary building project, let's assume that we're going to have cut stone blocks on the inside and we're going to have manufactured blocks as the casing for the pyramid. So in terms of the foundation, as I mentioned in the pre a previous episode, uh, we've got to have a nice level bedrock base or a very good foundation, a solid block foundation. And of course, as I also mentioned in a previous episode, indentations which uh, give extra strength to the blocks so they, they've got a nice place to sit in. So once the blocks are cut and transported to the location for construction, the next problem is how to ensure a tight fit. Assuming the blocks are cut to the right size or approximately the right size, then fitting them together should be straightforward. But the ancients wanted the fit between blocks to be incredibly tight. So they needed for each block to go through a very specific process with the, each of the blocks that they were going to be placed next to. The concept is similar to what we did with the polygonal, but this time it's vibration that is used instead. As each block is placed, they used a machine to create a vibration at a certain frequency which would stimulate the areas they were touching to essentially get the blocks to sand each other down until they were a perfect fit. And of course, dust, etc. would have to be removed and, and the block then put back into its final position. For the blocks that were manufactured, which in the case of our imaginary pyra pyramid, they are the casing stones, then the process would, that would apply to them is very similar to the one I described in, in part two, when we discussed the use of membranes as um, a repository for the liquid mix that would then harden and become the manufactured block. The next most important part of the building process is the lifting of the blocks. But as this is becoming a very long episode, I'm going to have to put that into another, another, another episode. But needless to say, there were techniques for the lifting of the blocks, which made that part of it relatively easy. So layer by layer, the stones are fitted into place. Some cut stones with a precision tight fit, others rough cut blocks, others manufactured blocks, and yet others just some rough fill for the center parts. So in terms of the next episode, I'm going to address the final parts of building our imaginary pyramid and discuss the machines required and the lifting process at that time. But I must say that nothing was ever taken as chance when it came to building the, the buildings of the ancients. And once a plan had been put in place, it was adhered to. That is how they managed to get the, the, the perfect measurements because they worked it out beforehand and they stuck with the plan. You may notice that I didn't get into any of the reasons or the measurements incorporated into the pyramids, except to say that the plan had to address all the factors that they wanted to achieve. And I will actually do some episodes, separate from stonework episodes, where I talk about what the pyramids were actually for. I have touched on that in some shorts, so I've actually already told you roughly, you know, in a generalistic sense, what they were for, but uh, I'll get into some more detail in another episode, but that'll be way in the future when I finished off all this stonework stuff, and I've also got a a quite an exciting episode to to um, to put together for you on a dream that I had about the schist disc or the, the disc of Sabu. So um, there's lots and lots of stuff yet to come 
which I think you'll all find very interesting if you can manage to wade through some of my explanations. There is one more thing I'd like to mention before I end this episode, because I've been asked about it by lots of people, and that's about rock melting. Now, I didn't see any, well, much rock melting on a large scale in any of my dream regressions. I only saw it on a small scale in the universities. But um, I do have some detailed dreams on glass production, if anyone is interested. And I thought that was very interesting. So let me know in the comments if you are interested in hearing about the glass production of the ancients. It's quite different to the way we do things. Anyway, that is the end of this episode on stonework, and it's kind of turned into an episode about how to build a pyramid or a recipe for pyramid building. So, um, yeah, it's kind of taken on a whole life of its own, this episode, hasn't it? But the next episode will be on machines and the technology for lifting. So that is going to be extremely ex exciting. And... Um, I guess I'll catch you all next time. Bye.